the best thing about Porkfest is that it happened, Porkfest continued in, in June of 2020. You remember those days? We, who was here for that? Oh, hardcore, hardcore. Yeah, disease, panic, germs are everywhere, don't get out, you know, you have to stay under your sofa for, you know, uh, <laughs> the pathogen's gonna come get you, the government says, and, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's not very funny, I guess, but um, I don't know, looking back, it does seem actually kind of preposterous, doesn't it, in a way? Anyway, I was reading the data in January, and I thought, oh, a typical textbook pathogen is here. Like they are always here and always come and that's just the way life is. And what are we doing shutting down human rights for? You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, a lot of people agreed and showed up at Porkfest that year. And it was funny, I, I don't know, I mean, Carla, I don't think organized anything <laughs> that year at all. And it somehow worked out. We had a great time. There was no disease panic, you know. Uh, they had bracelets on. If you wanted to do elbow bumps and six feet of distance and comply with the CDC, you wore a, uh, uh, I think it was like a sticker uh, with, a, with a, <clears throat> um, a dunce hat on, you know, or something like that. Say, I'm an idiot, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's fun. I remember there, that year there were two guys walking around in masks and I kind of shamed them for it. I kind of felt bad later. Now I don't feel bad anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, they deserved it, yeah. Anyway, okay, now I, I warned several people about this uh, talk that this is my stupid talk. It's gonna be uh, dumb and unintelligent and unintellectual um, and make no references whatsoever to Kierkegaard or Hegel or Nietzsche. And I will not re re be reviewing the history of the late Middle Ages, as I so often tediously do. Instead, I'm just going to talk about normal life stuff. And in doing so, I'm going to review a lot of what I've written over the course of my career, which is the advantage to having an old guy who's not yet senile come speak, because I have a lot of experience. So I, I, I just kind of quickly uh, this morning <laughs> wrote down 10 points. I don't know what they are, but um, no, let's just kind of march through them because I think these are little, uh, little things that I have to tell you that um, in, in the course of kind of moving you know, here and there around the country and doing this and that, um, but what people thank me most for is not my high theoretical insights or my reconstruction of the history of right-wing collectivism or anything like that. Uh, it's always for one of these 10 points, you know? It's the practical stuff. Oh, you know, I should add something too. And I was telling this to Alison Reagan here, uh, who's her first time Porkfest. And she, she called me last night, she goes, you know what's so interesting? Uh, there are lots of regular people here. I said, that's exactly... Um, first time I came here, I had been, I had been traveling around the world going to uh, academic conferences with the, with, with the stay home, stay safe crowd. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the elites, you know, uh, or the people who imagine themselves to be the elites, uh, theoreticians rather than practitioners. And coming to New Hampshire for the very first time, I realized something really important, that liberty is not just a parlor game. It's something that affects our lives profoundly and something you have to strive for in your daily life and really live it out. And after that first experience, and that was something like 2011, I realized if liberty had a hope anywhere, it was right here in New Hampshire because here you have people who genuinely believe enough to live out their principles, not just talk about them. And by the way, you will notice that the people who just talk about them and never do anything about them are the same people who said nothing about lockdowns and mandates for two years. They shut up and complied. So, F them. Liberty lives here in New Hampshire, and it's because, uh, because there's a group of people who genuinely believe. So that got me to work, and I began to work about 
on little ways that you can make your life better. So let's start with the most important thing, which is your shower in the morning. <laughs> so this is all about the shower head. Now, you've probably read my writings about this in the past, so I'm not going to bore you, but I'm still very passionate about it because the indoor plumbing is one of the great inventions of civilization. And I'm probably going to get the dates wrong. So, but sometime in the 1980s, there was something like some Clean Water Act or some water preservation, something, something, where the government limited how much uh, water could come out of your shower head uh, at any one time. Um, and just like overnight, um, ruined the mo one of the most important parts of the day, which is to go in and take a really wonderful shower by putting this little plug in all the shower. Well, they c c mandated that manufacturers put these things in all the showers. <clears throat> and they're called, uh, what are they called? Somebody like, uh, what are they? Flow restrictors. Yeah, flow restrictors. And, th and they always advertise, it's like, this, you get this shower uh, head because it's uh, efficient and saves water. Well, I don't want to save water. Well, you have to save water, or else you're a bad person. Oh, OK, well. All right, so uh, the very first time I had the experience with this, I took down the shower head. I thought, my, sh my shower, I remember as a kid b being able to get shampoo out of my hair vaguely, you know? I remember feeling happy after my shower, and not feeling you have to, like, you have to run around, you know, in the shower to, it, it was, it, it's, or stand really close, you know, and get frustrated and finally give up and turn it off. No. So anyway, I took out the shower head. Um, um, I used a, kooks, corks, a uh, screwdriver and banged out that flow stopper. And pew, it was like I was a child again. You know, it's a normal shower. I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. I thought, what the hell? So I became kind of a, 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 an expert at this, you know. And, and I would go to the uh, uh, hardware store and, and see that they had all these, shower, all these shower heads and they all have their own, you know, sort of, sort of advertising gizmo, you know, like, oh, this one's this big around and this one's got a thing and this has got a stretchy cord or whatever. And what I discovered finally is that the best shower head that you can get at the Home Depot costs $2.50. <laughs> it's a little plastic thing. You just stick it up there. And, the, and the, the plug comes out very easily. You just reach in there with a corkscrew, turn it, pull it out, pop. I tell you, it's very satisfying to do. Because when you do that, you've defied the Leviathan state. I mean, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's just a little turn. Puck, pull it out, boom. You know, um, uh, let's go, Brandon, or whatever. <laughs> so, it's it's a great moment. Uh, so I started buying these things up like in bulk and giving them away for Christmas gifts. Now here's your hacked shower head. That's a strange gift. And then three days later, they call me up. That was a game changer. I've got a different life now. Now, people say, well, that wastes water. Well, maybe not because, well, here's the thing. Uh, this is actually interesting. Uh, do you know how sometimes, <clears throat> either in your home or you go to hotels and do this, you turn the water to hot and you feel it, it's still cold? <sighs> so you turn it the other way and it's even colder. So they have, okay, I must have had it on the hot side. You're still sleep, you know, and you keep touching it. And it's a little, now it's tepid, now it's a little bit warm, and then finally it's hot. But this is like five minutes later. Okay, the reason is that's, you know, all the cold water has to flow through there to finally get to the hot water from the hot water tank. And the reason it takes so long is because the flow is so low, right? So you actually are using vast amounts of water anyway just to get to that point, you're leaving it on. And also, at some point you get frustrated and go make a cup of coffee, you take a phone call, you check your email, it's been running for 30 minutes, you find, oh, finally it's warm. So there's that factor. The other thing is that, you know, with a good shower, you take a shorter shower, you know? I mean, you get in there and I'm done. I and mean, that's it. Well, the other thing about that is that um, if you look up at the Department of Yada Yada, what's one of those deep state bureaucracies, interior. 
they uh, they chronicle exactly how much water is used by what source where and why. And it, and it turns out that domestic water consumption for like household water consumption, include, including all the wash and the showers and the sinks and the toilets and watering your yard constitutes 1% of the overall water use in this country. So this is stupid. <laughs> The, the fact, I mean, so why did they do it to, but I have a theory about why they did this to us, because they want us to be miserable. <laughs> they like us to suffer, you know? So, so we, there, there's a, a, a term I tried to coin, but it turned out somebody already used it, the sadistic state, right? That's what it is. We live in a sadistic state. They want us to suffer all the time, whether it's a mask, on your face, a shot in your arm, or a shitty shower, you know? That's how they want us to live. So you can overcome this with this one little trick. That's a good trick. All right, so that's my first, first grade hack. All right, my second hack relates to the hot water itself. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but starting about, I don't know, 20 years ago or something, we started having this thing called Energy Star appliances. One of them was a hot water heater that are shipped at 110 degrees. Now, uh, I, that's what they call hot water. Okay, this is 110 degrees. I know, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a baker, is the perfect temperature for rising yeast, which is to say that uh, things love to grow in 110 uh, degrees. I mean, this is not uh, enough hot water to do anything. It's just, it's absolutely awful. And, and, and with, with 110 temperature, you can't get your clothes clean uh, at all. By the way, never believe anything in the New York Times. You know, it's just... Uh, they ran an article a few years ago, and they said how to do laundry. And the first step was, the first thing they said was, always use the cold water se setting. <laughs> and, All right, you guys have no idea how to do laundry. You know, this is just stupid. Anyway, you can't take a sh 110 degrees for a shower. So you want really hot water. And the reason they changed the temperature, they say, was to save children's lives. Okay. Yeah, because so many children were just dying of burns or whatever. I don't know what the... Uh, <clears throat> they wanted to save the kids' lives so that later they could inject them with their uh, mRNA shots or something. I don't know what. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, you can go to your hot water heater and hack it, right? You just turn it from 110, and my favorite setting is about 145. And it just fundamentally changes your life. And here again, people will say, well, no, that's bad because that raises your electricity bill. Well. Okay, but we pay our electricity bills, and if you don't want to pay the extra, you know, turn it back to 90 for all I care. But if you don't mind paying a few extra, you know, $3 a month for a daily hot shower and clothes that are clean instead of stinky, um, <clears throat> it's, a good, it's a good thing to do. Crank up that hot water. I noticed most recently that, because uh, uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with household appliances, that at the Home Depot, uh, now they make it very hard to get to the temperature setting on the hot water heater. So uh, that, that's, uh, that can be kind of tricky. All right. So the third one um, deals with the water pressure itself. Now, this is a much trickier issue because um, this is another thing that, that the sadistic state to make, make our, did to make our lives utterly miserable was uh, reduce our water pressure. Now, this was a kind of a disaster because, huh, actually, this speaks to an issue that I don't, for which I do not have a hack, but I, will, I do have a lot of complaints. Uh, low flow toilets. Oh, here's an interesting story. <clears throat> so, uh, about a year ago, I was in Texas. And there's a 13-story uh, hotel that had not been inhabited at, at for like 40 years, and a guy bought it. And he wanted me to go through the hotel to just look at the condition of it and see, see what could be done to the place and see what, you know, what suggestions I had. 
and and nobody had uh, it's, uh, the, the the place had not been in use in in many many decades. So a lot of sort of vagabonds and random people had been uh, uh, rocking through the place. I I went through every floor of the hotel and most rooms, and in every single one, the toilet had been stolen. I mean, all the desks were there, the light fixtures were fine, everything. Every toilet had been ripped out, <laughs> and. Right? So, and the reason is the government limited our toilet flows to 1.6 gallons, which is appalling, you know? And, and, you know, entrepreneurs have been trying to innovate their way around, around this for a very long time. You know, like, well, here's my great new uh, uh, toilet and, and, and watch my video in which I, I flush uh, marbles or I flush newspapers. Well, <clears throat> Marbles and newspapers are, are fine, but, but I can promise you this toilet does not work on what it's supposed to work on. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, it's just the way it is. And, the, and then other innovations are like putting weird exploding devices. You ever been in, in, a, in a bathroom and you're like, well, you know, life's good, life's good, you know, that went well, now it's time to flush it, and you touch it, and it goes you're like, what, what the hell was that? And this is you know, some high-pressure electro unit in there or something. This is all just to overcome the problem of 1.6 gallons, whereas they used to be four. It's one of the reasons I love visiting my mom in Texas. Great toilets. House built in the 1950s, you know. It was nothing we can do about that. Oh, and as a result of the low-flow to low toilets. That's why there's always a plunger next to every... When I was a kid, there's no plungers. I mean, a plunger is something you use once every 10 years when some, you know, appalling calamity happened. And now, if you don't have a plunger by your toilet, it's a disaster because you're going to have a guest come over to your house and kind of come and whisper to your ear during cocktail hour, I'm so sorry, but do you have a plunger anywhere? <laughs> Deeply embarrassed. They never come back again, right? So... The other problem with the low-flow to low flow toilets is they don't actually clean the toilet well. You know, you need a lot of water, like rushing. Hey, you know, indoor plumbing is a good thing, by the way. I'm in favor of it. We've had it since, like, ancient Rome or whatever. We only screwed it up in, like, 1980-something. It's unbelievable what we've done. So now we don't have a lot of water flowing through there, so it always stinks vaguely. Why does this bathroom stink? It's kind of strange. I have a vague sense of a sewer smell in here. Well, the reason is there's not enough water going through it to clean it up. And this is why the inside of the tank is always breaking on you because it builds up all this sediment and, and, and crap from, you know, whatever. I mean, just like, because the water is sitting too still, there's not enough of it. So everything's always breaking all the time. So every guy has now had to become like the master of plumbing. You know, sorry, honey, got to go over to Home Depot and buy some new inside parts for the toilet. Wait, you just did that last month. I know, but they're, they're broken and they're full of crud now. And, and uh, that plug, it's, it doesn't work anymore. You know, when I was a kid, a toilet was for life, you know? Nothing ever went wrong with them because they're always being cleaned. So that's not true anymore. I don't have a hack for that, or at least not one that wouldn't land you in the federal uh, pen. Uh, for a while there, there was a nice smuggling operation going from the Canada-U.S. border to smuggle Canadian toilets into the U.S., but the, a bunch of people were arrested and, like, jailed for this, you know? So, very dangerous operation. They're probably available somewhere, but not on eBay. You probably have to go to whatever the new equivalent of the Silk Road is to get those things, and you're going to pay more than property in Austin, Texas, you know, for that. Where, where's my Austin, Texas guy? Um, yeah. Um, anyway, wow, that's not, I have no fix for that, unfortunately. That's very sad. Oh, anyway, back to the water pressure. Quite often, if you own your own home, the water pressure valve is going to be in the front yard near where the city can get to it. You can go there, pull off the top, and there are videos on YouTube, and turn up the water pressure. Now, a plumber won't do this for you because they're forbidden by federal law and licensing and regulations. So you have to figure it out yourself. We live in a do-it-yourself society, unfortunately. But you can turn up that water pressure, and it'll change everything. It changes 
you know, how much water flows through your toilet, even at 1.6 gallons. It'll make your shower better. Just, and, 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 uh, and even washing dishes at the sink becomes actually viable. Oh, and when you have to fill up your coffee pot, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, schedule a, a 30 minutes, you know. To what is it with all these things? Even the sink in the bathroom, right? You turn them on, it's... You just have to sit there staring at it, you know? You try to shave, you can't do it. And then that clogs up, you have to clean that. God, our world is so screwed up. Anyway, changing the water pressure can change a lot of things. All right, now let's go on to the next subject, which is laundry. And this speaks to a very profound found issue, which is that soap is supposed to have phosphate in it, damn it. Phosphate was discovered in the 16th century. You can make your own, by the way. We don't want to go there. Um, but, but it's essential for soap, and here's the reason. Soap is good at cleaning things, but soap does not automatically break itself down. It needs some agent to break it down and get rid of it. So if you put your laundry in the, uh, uh, into the washing machine with just laundry soap and nothing else, here's what happens. It cleans and cleans and cleans and cleans, and it scrubs all the dirt, it scrubs all the oil, but the soap stays in the clothes, and so does all the dirt and the oil, and that's why your clothes look like shit, because they don't ultimately get clean because there's nothing to break down the soap and get rid of it. That's what phosphate does. Now, phosphates were eliminated <clears throat> in American uh, laundry detergent back in, again, the 1980s because there seemed to be a pond somewhere in Michigan where the fish were feeling overcrowded because there was too much algae in the pond. And the fish were like, there's just like so much algae in here, I can hardly swim. So, uh, so, so the federal government said, no problem, fish. We'll, we'll, make, we'll eliminate phosphates from all detergent and make everybody look like shit. And so the fish were like, oh, thanks. That gives us a lot more room to swim around. But it turns out, if you look this up, this whole lake was polluted by, guess what? Uh, fertilizer from a nearby farm. All right? It wasn't polluted by the people in West Hartford, Connecticut, using phosphates in their detergent. So this is bullshit, all right? So, but they eliminate it by law. And of course, the poor, I feel sorry for free enterprise in a way, these, these commercial establishments. Always, you know, the idea of capitalism is, is that everything is supposed to be new and improved. Well, not anymore. Everything is worse than it was before. But the merchants aren't gonna tell you that. So you can't go and buy Tide with a sticker that says, this sucks compared to what it used to be. Blame the government, not us. No, they still say a new formula, new and improved formula. Well, the formula is no good. Anyway, you can fix this by, even now, you can do this. Go over to the paint section of the Home Depot or whatever, or you can even buy it on Amazon, unless you're in Wisconsin, <laughs> where they figured this trick out and, about, and uh, it won't allow TSP. You can get trisodium phosphate. Make sure you get the real stuff and not the fake trisodium phosphate. Everything is, is like this these days, right? You have to figure out what's real and what's fake. There's a fake TSP, don't get that. Get the real trisodium phosphate. Put about two tablespoons into your laundry and you will be absolutely amazed. Your socks, T-shirts, your sweatshirts, everything, your jeans, everything comes out for the first time in your life actually clean. Like you pick it up and it's crunchy. You're like, oh, yeah, that's the way clothes used to feel back before we all were wearing dirty clothes all the time. <clears throat> Obviously, you use hot water. But TSP is essential for every single load without exception. And if you don't do that, you're not really getting clean. And here's the other thing. I don't know how many of you use dishwashers. A lot of people have just given up on dishwashers. They think they suck. Dishwashers are terrible. Every time I put anything in the dishwasher, I pull it out, and there's spots over the glasses, and everything gets worse all the time. Well, I was probably, I was at some house the other day, and I said, hey, can I have a glass of wine? They gave it to me, and the glass was cloudy. It looked horrible. And the guy said, yeah, don't forget about the, the, that glass. It's because of our, he had some hard water. Oh, yeah, 
bullshit. It's not because you're hard water. It's because the uh, it's because the it's because of the the uh, soap you use in your uh, dishwashing machine. It's no good because it doesn't have phosphate in it. So throw a teaspoon in there, and you'll be amazed. Everything gets clean. The glasses look perfect. Everything's just great. So that's I don't know what is that hack number five something like that. Okay. I told you this talk was going to be boring. All right. Oh, God. Now, I don't want to raise a controversial point in this audience, because I know you're all nice people, and so far you kind of like me. Well, he's quirky, he's weird. <clears throat> but mostly what he sounds sounds plausible. What I'm about to tell you right now is the thing I would say that's changed the most lives of anything I've ever discovered, uh, most lives on this planet. This is the one advice I've given that I think has improved the lot of humanity more than any other. And I can almost guarantee every time a person comes up to me practically with tears in their eyes and says, Mr. Tucker, I just want to thank you because I know what's coming next. They will say to me, because of you, I gave up shaving cream. Oh, I heard that. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. I know it's a scandal. It's terrible. But you just got to try it. Just give it up. And that's, that's the bottom line. I can go in much more deeper into this. But basically, I believe that shaving cream is a racket. And it's a racket that began sometime in the 1950s or 60s, most likely. And here's the way I think it began. This is my theory. So every guy... Uh, uh, Every guy has, uh, looks forward to the time when, uh, when you get whiskers on your face, right? It's a big deal. And you're 11 and you're 12, you're like, where's my whiskers? And your friend gets whiskers, you're like, what the hell's wrong with me? Um, and then finally you get them, but they're kind of spotty. They're a little bit here, a little bit there, and you get a little mustache. You can't wait for that great moment when you can control what your face looks like by getting a mustache or a beard or something like that. So, the thing for a, an adolescent at that age is that shaving cream gives you this beautiful private moment in the bathroom where you can pretend to have a beard. I don't know, she's laughing. She's like, is this true? I mean, this is guys, right? We're idiots. I don't know what to tell you. This is the kind of things we do. And so we're like alone in the bathroom, and you're looking in the mirror. You're like, I'm looking pretty good, looking pretty good. But now I think I can put on some shaving cream. And you lather it up, and you <laughs> sculpt it really well, and you put it, and you just stare at yourself like, so that's what I look like with a beard. And it's kind of an exciting moment. It was kind of a moment of feeling grown up, you know? It's just great. And then, of course, you take the razor and scrape off the beard. So it's all just this big pretend game, but, which is fine, you know, as I like dress ups or something. But... The thing is that it leads us to believe that you have to have this foam on your self <laughs> to shave. And the hell of it is that this cream on your face actually breaks down your skin. It tenderizes it, pulverizes it like a chicken or something. It's just absolutely horrible what it does to your skin and, and increases dependence. And by the way, all products on your face are going to do this. Did you ever get addicted to chapstick at one point in your life? Oh, th thank you. So I'm not just completely ridiculous. Uh, it happens, right? You're, you're like, yeah, you know, my lips are kind of dry. I'll put on some chapstick. And then later you're like, you know, I felt good. I'll put on some more. And the next day you're like, you know, I, I probably need some more chapstick. You put some more on. And pretty soon you're like walking around with this stuff in your pocket all the time. And, you know, like 18 times a day you're putting on lips. And at some point somebody says to you, dude, are you addicted to this stuff? You cut it out. And you're like, oh, good point, good point. So you go a full day, cold turkey, no chapstick, and your lips go back to normal, right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, I guess not. Um, it's the same thing with shaving cream. You develop a dependence on shaving cream because you use it so much. I don't know, some secret chemical in there. Probably, it's probably, uh, uh, probably you know, based on mRNA technology or something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what's in it. But, but it's very dangerous for you. <clears throat> and if you just give it up, you'll be much better off. But don't expect immediate results, right? I mean, the first time you go without shaving cream, it's a little bit alarming. 
uh, you're, you're like, well, there's no chance. There's an entire industry out there entirely based on a lie, uh, just a complete scam. That can't be true that huge corporations are marketing some foamy bullshit that you don't need at all. I mean, that's not believable. Yes, it is believable. <laughs> I mean, it's been, and they've been succeeding at it for, well, I don't know, 70 years or something like that. So you get rid of it. The time to shave is when you're in the shower, when you immediately get out. Uh, yeah, you can use soap if you want to transition there. Even a little baby oil is fine or whatever for your wimp. <clears throat> but in the end, you know, you're going to make your make your face tough, no shaving cream. You shave. And, and if you want to get really hardcore, you do it with a cold razor and no water. That's the point at which you've arrived. <laughs> okay. That's very good advice. You're not believing me, but it's true. All right. My next great hack. Ha! So, maybe this won't surprise you, but I used to be in the clothing industry. Yep. Sold clothes. The best salesman in the shop. Somebody would come in there. Sir, can I help you? No, I'm just looking. Oh, really? Well, I tell you what, we got some new suits in. Not interested. Okay. Can I show them anyway? They're really cool. Okay. Walks out with five suits, you know? So I was good. I was very good at selling suits. And uh, uh, one day a guy came, and I was the lead salesman. I mean, I was, the, you know, 17, 18, 19. I was beating everybody in the shops, high-end shops, very good. And a guy came to me, <clears throat> he said, you know, you're so good at sales, why don't you come to work at my furniture shop uh, where you could make a lot more money? I said, okay, well, here's what I learned. There's no such thing as just being good at sales. There's only good at <laughs> selling something that you believe in. <laughs> and it turned out I hated furniture. I just thought it was a big scam. Like every bit of that furniture. High end, low end, bad, good, oh, this one has this, this one has that, oh, look at this molding. It's all nonsense, right? If you like the furniture, buy it. If you don't like it, don't buy it. If you like the price, buy it. If you don't like it. But, but there's no difference between a $500 sofa and a $50,000 sofa. It's all nonsense. And the whole industry is a huge racket. So I figured this out within the first week. And uh, so I couldn't sell anything. Couldn't sell anything. I was awful at it. And the guy said, look, you need to put more pressure on people. A lot more pressure. So I thought, well, all right. I guess you are immoral bastards. And if I'm going to make it here, I've got to join you. So uh, I, I really pressured this lady into buying a coffee table. But while she was checking out, she was bawling her eyes out. She's like, I didn't really want to buy this. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I thought, you know, I got to get out of here. You know, this is not my kind of industry. Anyway, I went into the, I, I went back into the clothing business because I like it. I'm good at selling things if I believe in them. I've always believed in clothing. Uh, but suits are way too expensive. <clears throat> and and these the suit manufacturers are able to get away with this. Uh, guys don't know anything about clothing at all. But there's always an occasion where they have to wear a suit. You know, my sister's getting married, I have to wear a suit. You know, whatever the thing is, there's always an occasion where you have to wear a suit. And so then you go to the shop and you're just like an idiot, you go in there. And next thing you know, you're, you're spending two or $3,000 on a, on a suit. And I'm just telling you, don't do it. Um, what I've, wow, I feel like I'm giving away all these secrets. What I do is uh, troll eBay all the time. Now, I said this to a friend of mine. I said, oh, yeah, that's fine. I don't mind uh, wearing used clothing. Okay, I never thought of them as used clothing. I just think of them as clothing. And I think the reason I, I didn't think of that as used is that I worked in a clothing store where every suit was tried on seven times before one person bought it. So basically everything you buy at the new store is also used. So whatever. Um, <clears throat> also, we have dry cleaners, for God's sake. Uh, anyway, if you know what you're doing, you can get suits uh, that made to measure suits that will cost as much as two, three, four thousand dollars in high-end shops 
for, you know, as low as uh, 50, 100, 150 bucks, if you know what you're doing. If, if, and, and, and maybe that's the trick, you have to know what you're doing. But first of all, most guys don't know what size they are, okay? You want to find out what size you are, go to one of the retail shops, pretend to be interested in their clothing, find uh, some sucker like me who's going to spend a lot of time with you, figure out what suit fits you best, and then walk out, well, I'll think about it, I have to ask my girlfriend, and leave. And, uh, and, then, and then go to eBay and look up that size, make sure whatever you buy is, number one, uh, not shipped from China. <laughs> like, never do that. God bless China, but... Uh, uh. Um, uh, and uh, don't buy anything new that's advertised as new. Uh, buy the used stuff. Make sure it's all wool. Buy a brand uh, that is a good brand, you know? And, uh, uh, wow, not to give away too many secrets, but this is an Oxford suit, O-X-X, O-X-X, F-O-R-D, made to measure suit. Uh, it's the highest end, it's America's answer to Savile Row. Reagan wore these suits, it's the best suit made in America. I won't tell you what the price I paid for it on eBay, but it's very, that's very, it would be very tacky. But I can tell you, I used to sell these in a, in a high end made, made to measure shop uh, for, for several thousand dollars. And you're not gonna pay that at eBay. You can get this stuff for 100, 150 bucks. Why would you pay several thousand dollars when you get something for a few hundred? I, do, I don't understand it, but that's the way to go. If you don't like it, send it back. You can do the same thing with blazers. Um, there's a lot of things you could do that way with it. I don't know, and you know, what, you know what prevents people from using these obvious solutions? It's just snobbery. It's just snobbery. It's the same reason that some people won't go to Aldi and they have to go to Whole Foods. I mean, you go to Whole Foods. Oh, great, you've got a Schubert string quintet playing. You know, congratulations for you. Oh, that doesn't make my, my you know, worth it for me to pay twice as much for a hamburger. What the hell? But people go to be seen and seen. More than that, they go to define who they are. I'm the kind of person who shops at Whole Foods. I wouldn't buy a suit from eBay. That's not my class. That's not who I am. Screw that. Snobbery is the enemy of frugality. They're robbing you because of your perceptions of who you are and, and because of rejecting the things that you think are beneath you. I think it's all nonsense. So <clears throat> all these tips are really about finding the best value and doing the right thing regardless of uh, those class associations that people have with it. So buy your suits on eBay. Uh, oh, yeah. Now, let's talk about furniture. Yeah, furniture, Jesus. Boy, that, my furniture experience, that wrecked me, I tell you. Uh, what a bunch of crap. I mean, I just can't, I can't even believe how much junk people, what, what people are willing to pay for the junk. Also, furniture stores go out of the way to set up in this beautiful way. This could be you. Would you like this to be your bedroom? Imagine the kind of entertaining you could do with this living room, you know? It's always pretty. <clears throat> Well, it's just garbage, and they're paying, to, paying too much. Look, unless you have all the money in the world, in which case none of this stuff matters. But I don't. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg in 2005 invented this thing called Facebook, which is the worst thing that ever happened to humanity as far as I'm concerned. But there is one good thing. <laughs> I hate that thing. It's just rotten. Uh, but it has one good thing. It has a marketplace. And you just scroll by where you are and put in dining room table, whatever. And sure enough, I swear to you, you will find, you know, within five square miles of your house, uh, you know, like, like, a, like, like a dining room table that seats eight or 10 or 12 for like $200. And they just want you to come pick it up. Or a free piano. Pfft. All you have to do is pay to get it, get it out of the person's house. That's what pianos are worth these days. It's kind of sad, but... But anyway, you can get the best furniture on Facebook Marketplace. It's unbelievable. Uh, people that are moving, you know, people that are sick of New England, you know, they're headed to Florida, and they just want to get rid of everything. They take a snapshot of it, put it on Facebook. You drive up to their house. And here's the best thing about shopping on Facebook Marketplace like that. You go into somebody's house, and, and you're like, can I have that desk? They're like, sure, uh, that'll be $100. And then you say, you know, that's a nice mirror. And they're like, yeah, take it. Huh. Well, you know, that's a nice chair. Yeah, pfft, 
throw that in for five bucks. Well, how about that nice, you know, rolling bar over there? Yeah, you take it. I mean, next thing you know, take a big trailer. You'll be emptying out their house. They're just glad to get rid of the crap. Also, it's so cheap anyway. You know, they're not really making money from it. They're already getting rid of it. They're already paying the expenses of moving anyway. They want it out of their house. So it's a great chance to just, just, just take stuff for free. I mean, you can save thousands, tens of thousands of dollars this way. It's amazing uh, what you can get away with uh, shopping for things on Facebook Marketplace. Okay, um, I've only got three more left. Oh, yeah, well this one follows easy, this is number eight. Uh, obviously thrift stores, right? I'm sorry that the world has recently discovered thrift stores. I predicted this would happen when the inflation started, when Brandon took office. I thought, uh-oh, everybody's gonna be pillaging the thrift stores and discover them. I love thrift stores. Again, you have to let go of your snobbery. You go in, it's kind of a strange smell, yeah? It's, ugh. And everything's kind of ugh, gritty and it takes hours because you can't find anything, nothing's you know, right. You know, the, the coat's over here, the pants are over there, you have to match them up, whatever. There's all these things. Uh, but the shoes are one, they have, you could, but, and even if you go three times and find nothing, that fourth time you'll find treasures, you know? Great oil paintings, fabulous shoes, um, <clears throat> uh, knit shirts galore, uh, jeans, it's, uh, it's amazing. I have so much stuff that I bought at thrift stores. And, and nowadays, you notice they're getting a little more high end, a little more snob, you know, but I'm sorry, sir, that'll be $30. Like, what the hell? It's just a suit. Worth three thousand dollars. <laughs> Why are you charging thirty for it? Anyway, I stop at every Goodwill, no matter what. I just can't keep me out of Goodwills. I just love those places. They're just fantastic. Just great. And you know, uh, you can also, as they say, feel good because you're helping people and you know, supporting the community. Blah 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 blah. I don't care about that stuff. But all right, I've only got five minutes left, and I want to take questions. All right, number nine. Ha. Wow, didn't we learn this one over the last couple of years? Take your health into your own hands. <clears throat> when this pandemic response started, they treated us like lab rats, like the whole of society had a disease. We didn't. The whole of society did not have a disease. Shut down hospitals on schools and bars all over the country. People in, 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 in West Texas, rural West Texas, were being arrested by SWAT teams for drinking beers. What the hell? You know? And it's because the public health had decided they were going to cure society of disease. Society did not have a disease. There's a normal pathogen that a particular uh, focused uh, uh, severity on one demographic, and we had a global response that destroyed our health in so many ways. Uh, everybody put on what they call the COVID-19, the 19 more pounds that you got from just languishing in your home and not going anywhere. Terrible. Uh, so, health into your own hands. There's a lot of people specialize in this. I'm ever more believing what they say. Uh, yesterday I was on a podcast with a guy who loves reading the Brownstone Institute material and in the course of the thing, he began to reveal that he was every cranky thing you can imagine. Uh, homeopathy, chiropractic, you know, all this sort of heterodox medical things. And I'm listening to him thinking, God knows. Maybe he's 100% correct about everything. Like, I don't even know what to believe anymore about these people, but I do know that the medical establishment went very wrong. Where were the doctors? Where were the doctors uh, uh, to speaking out against the outrage of the last uh, two years? I, I will talk about a lot more about this on Saturday night. Um, okay, my final uh, uh, hack of your life. This sounds a little weird. I'm not even sure what I'm gonna say about it. It comes down to three words. Don't be famous. It sucks. I think it's awful the way young people are being trained to now to believe that they all need to grow up to be TikTok influencers, you know? To get a big audience on YouTube or whatever the hell. It's all just grim. Fame is awful. 
You however temporarily surround yourself by people who pretend to like you but are not there for you when the cancel police come for you and try to destroy your life. Uh, it just allows people to intrude on your life. They treat you like a commodity, uh, commodify you. You're no longer in charge of your life. You don't have your independence. You don't have your privacy. And you're surrounded by fake fans until they get tired of you and move on to somebody else. Being famous sucks. Don't do it. If you're not famous, congratulate yourself. You did the right, you're doing it the right way. The whole world is telling you that you should be famous. You know why? Because the whole world wants to spy on everyone. They want all your data, they want all your information so that they can track you and control you. That's it. The only way you avoid them is by avoiding this grave, grotesque temptation to believe the lie that, that unless you're famous, you don't matter. Everybody matters. Everybody has human dignity. And you're going to live a longer, better, happier life if you can avoid that most terrible fate of fame. All right, that's my 10 points. Thank you. Yeah, we've got like three minutes if anybody has any questions on uh, how to use a corkscrew to hack your showerhead or anything like that. Yeah, that showerhead stuff is fascinating. Also, you could, uh, if you're rich enough, you could afford multiple showerheads, which is what most rich people do, instead of buying the cheap ones at Home Depot. But uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, one of the people that uh, took your advice regarding shaving cream. I haven't used shaving cream in years, but uh, uh, during the winter, I have a beard anyway, so it doesn't really count. But uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, no one's going to get rich telling you not to use a product, so no one's going to get rich telling you not to use shaving cream. Uh, also, no one's going to get rich telling you not to use shampoo. And uh, I recommend, if you want to go that route, uh, if you shampoo every day, don't just stop cold turkey. I recommend I say switch to every other day and then maybe switch to twice a week and then once a week. And then now I basically, I mean, I haven't completely quit. I, I, maybe twice a year I shampoo my hair. But yeah, you don't really need it. It basically, it's, uh, it washes all the healthy oils out of your hair. And uh, yeah. anyway, give it a try. And don't, I say don't quit cold turkey. Just wean yourself you, off. You of know, it. This, this line of thinking is funny. I had a friend of mine who went for the uh, shaving cream advice and then he went for the shampoo advice. And then the next week came to me and said, you know what I'm thinking? I don't think we need soap. <laughs> and about two weeks later, I went up to him and I said, you know, David, I think he needs soap. Thanks for being here. How do we stop the, the globalist, uh, transhumanist technocracy, Jeff? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, that, that's Saturday night. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I, I do know a lot about the problem, and we need to talk about it. That's the most important first thing, is to, to alert people about the depth of the problem. It's not going to change just by electing new marionettes into office. That will not work. Saturday night. That's, that's the big talk. All right, well, thank you all so much.